Hello and welcome to our next reflection on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Yesterday we finished off by reminding ourselves of the wonder of our being, marveling at the mystery of who we are, and being really amazed at the dignity that God in his mercy bestows on us, and at the same time the great mission that he is leaving us. The mission of being the living image of God for others. Part of Jesus' mission to us by coming to earth uh, was to reveal the face of the Father, to become a true revelation, the fullness of revelation about God. And we share in that mission. We share in that mission of revealing God to others uh, by the very fact of our creation within our own being before we even talk about sin or lack of sin, we are created to be a living image of God. We are created in his image. Uh, but we know that instead of portraying uh, who God is, and that is goodness, love, justice, mercy, uh, we portray other attributes. We portray and we present evil. And we bear witness to the reality of evil in our lives. And so in order to understand uh, where does evil come from, we need to talk about the reality of sin. It's a reality that uh, many struggle to name, to acknowledge, uh, and to give credence to. The Catechism mentions uh, to us and warns us about a futile attempt to give different names to this reality. Uh, it wants us to face the truth head on. And so it reminds us that sin is not just some developmental flaw. Uh, sin is not just part of your growth experience. Uh, sin is not just some sort of psychological weakness. Uh, it's not just a mistake uh, that you have committed. Sin is about a rejection of God. Sin is about standing in opposition to God. And so the truth, facing the truth of what is actually at stake, what is actually taking place within us. Because sin is about the abuse of freedom that God gives us. God creates everything good. Indeed, he finds it very good. But he has given us this great gift of freedom. Freedom within certain limits. Please enjoy my intimacy. Please walk in my presence. But for your health, for your well-being, do not eat of this fruit. And behind that sin of our first parents, behind that rejection of those limits that God imposes on us, uh, simply because we are creatures, we are not God. Behind that sin lies Satan, the devil, uh, another living being about whom we do not wish to talk about these days uh, so much. We would rather pretend he doesn't exist. But the Church reminds us he does. He is one of those fallen angels. Every angel has been created good by God. But those angels also within their freedom of serving God, of worshipping God, had a choice. In the case of the angels, the choice they made was irrevocable. You cannot undo that choice. And so in the case of the fallen angels, in the case of Satan or the devil, uh, the choice has been made to reject God. And that choice cannot be undone. Much in the same way as we human beings cannot repent after we die. Uh, the time for repentance, the time for change, the time of letting go of sin and enjoying the newness of life 
is this life that we are given. It's too late once we die, and that opportunity is no longer there for us. The Church reminds us that this fallen angel is filled with hatred of God, hatred of Jesus' kingdom, and he does everything to disrupt its growth. He is powerful because he is pure spirit. He can cause grave injury, both spiritual and physical, to every human being and to societies as a whole. Uh, but that power of the evil one always is within the boundaries of divine providence. Satan, uh, as a created angel that has fallen, is also a creature with limitations of a creature. His power is not infinite. And therefore the Church wants us to focus on the power of God. Every creature in heaven and on earth has to bend its knee at the name of Jesus. And so Satan's power is limited, and it only works within the boundaries of divine providence, because it is that mysterious divine providence that allows the devil uh, to continue its work, to cause injury to us at times. And that's the mysterious judgments of divine providence that we do not understand, but we are called to put our trust in God's protective power over us. Nothing can happen to you and to me without God's will and without God's allowing it to happen. And so this fallen angel, his mission is to make us fall as well. He is the tempter. He is the murderer. He is the father of lies from the beginning. And so his mission is to undermine the word of God given to us, just as he did for our first parents. Is this really what the Lord told you to? You can become like God. That's the Satan's mission. He thinks he can become like God and he wants us to think along the same lines. So what is the implication? The implication and the consequence of our fall uh, is that we want that. It is tempting to be powerful. We become the judge of what is good and of what is bad. We no longer listen to God. We no longer listen to his church we put ourselves above all that. We are the ones who make the decisions. The consequence of these actions is that we begin to fear God. This is the consequence of sin. Look at the story of our first parents in the garden. Uh, they are afraid of God. They inherit, they begin to have this distorted image of God within themselves. Maybe as God who punishes, uh, they don't, they no longer understand God for who God really is. And so they go into hiding. We run away from God. The harmony that God has put in place between us and himself in the garden all that is lost as a result of sin. The harmony that is present within our hearts is also disrupted uh, due to that sin. And so we talk, the Church talks about the reality of original sin, that sin of our first parents that is transmitted to us by our parents. So it's not something that uh, we do ourselves. It's not a personal act of sinning. It's a state that we inherit. That somehow through these first parents, our nature has become wounded. Our nature has been uh, transformed. 
and it needs healing. It needs saving. And that's why the Lord didn't give us up to ourselves, but he promised salvation. But what does that mean? That means that whilst we are alive, uh, we are in a real spiritual battle uh, that is going on all the time within us and around us. The battle is uh, to rediscover uh, that image of God that is true. Uh, to try to do our best not to have God made in our own image and likeness, but remember that we are created in his image. The battle is for that peace and harmony to be restored within us. There is a divine order of things, of creation, and that ordering also applies to our own hearts, also applies to what is taking place within us. Uh, and we need to now fight against certain desires, certain drives uh, that lead us in a different direction from which God intended. We are inclined to evil. And finally, the biggest consequence of that first original sin uh, is death. The punishment for sin, something that we all now have to experience one way or another at any given time in our life, uh, we will have to face that moment of death. As I mentioned, the good news is that the Lord hasn't left us to ourselves. From that very beginning, he promises us a saviour. He promises us salvation so that in this fight that is taking place, uh, we will know that we can count on God's strength to be our strength, on God's grace to save us, to redeem us, to make us whole again. So as we continue our reflections, uh, and this is where we end our reflection of the creed that refers to God the Father, creator of heaven, and on earth and of earth uh, let us be mindful that our life is portrayed as a battle and so we need to reflect on that how do i take part in this spiritual battle am i even aware that this battle is taking place and what are the weapons that the lord has left for me to use in this battle Let's continue to pray uh, and put our hopes in the Lord Jesus. God bless.